All right, good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to the second lecture of capsule number 3 or the sixth lecture in this particular course. Today we are going to look at uh, measurement pressure and air speed. So, the outline of today's uh, presentation is going to be we start first with pressure measurements, then we move on to measurement of air speed and uh, once we study about air speed measurement, we also need to know that there are different types of air speeds. So, we look at the differences between those speeds. We will also look at two measurements, one of altitude and the other of the rate of climb and descent and then we will move on to errors in the pneumatic measurements because most of the instrumentation in the aircraft so far has been based on pneumatics. We then look at how there are errors in compressible flows and what kind of compensations are provided and finally, we look at the future about usage of non pneumatic instruments for measuring pressure as well as speed as well as other parameters like angle of attack. Okay, so, let us start with pressure measurement. Essentially, what we need is a mechanism or a system on the aircraft that can sense uh, changes in pressure, but the question that immediately behoves us is which pressure are we measuring? Is it the stagnation pressure or the pressure when the fluid is brought to rest asyntropically or is it the static pressure or dynamic pressure? So, the question can be answered by saying let us measure both of them because both of them are of some use to us. We will see very soon. So, the measurements made such that the flow is not disturbed is called as the static pressure measurement and in static pressure measurement we have to be passive. The in both the cases of course, one should not disturb the flow field as far as possible to get a true reading. In static pressure measurement we are not interested in changing the parameters of the flow. In stagnation pressure measurement we need we want to measure it when you bring the flow to rest, but this rest but bringing the fluid to rest has to be done isentropically. So, what is isentropically? Do you remember we discussed this in one of our previous lectures? So, can somebody help me? What is meant by bringing flow to rest isentropically? So, what, what happens in isentropic flow or what does not happen in isentropic flow? No heat is exchanged. No heat is exchanged, no heat is lost or gained. Okay, would like to add something? Take the mic, mention your name first. Sir, my name is Satyam Rai. Yes. And sir, in isentropic process, uh, entropy should be zero. Entropy should not change. So, in real life, can we have an isentropic process? No. It is very difficult to have a physical process which is perfectly isentropic, but if the losses are minimized, if the heat gain and loss is almost negligible if the entropy change is almost negligible, then we can say that it is isentropic. So, why is it required to do isentropically? Yes, if you have some interesting point you can discuss in the class. As I mentioned in my first lecture, I prefer discussion and interaction. What is the difference between isentropic flow and adiabatic flow? What is the answer that we get to this? So, I would like you to elaborate that. That is a very, very, very valid point. So, you elaborate. What you are saying is the process that they have described is not isentropic but adiabatic. Okay. Okay. So can somebody answer? Yes. Please take a mic. There is a mic somewhere there in the middle. Sir, my name is Kavita. Yes. Adiabatic flow is uh, the one in which heat is uh, minimized. Okay. Uh, and when isentropic flow is the one uh, which is irreversible and irreversible. Reversible reversible not irreversible, but then what about entropy change? Is entropy change permitted in the adiabatic flow? What about uh, isentropic flow? Okay. Isentropic is both adiabatic. A reversible adiabatic flow is isentropic can we say that? Okay. So, we just go ahead basically we want to bring it to rest adi adiabatically. So, in the static pressure measurement what we normally do is there is a flow and you see there is one L shaped pipe. 
but that is not our concern right now. In the static pressure measurement, we have a, another pipe or a probe, but that is flush with the inner edge of the tube. So, therefore, it, it is not protruding inside and the pressure that it will measure is called as a static pressure. Okay. The one on your left is a tube which is going to probe inside, which is going to um, disturb the flow and that is going to measure the total pressure. Okay. Similarly, on the right hand side we see a similar thing, you have a total pressure connection and then on the side you have a static pressure connection and on the top you have a bent stem which has a static pressure port on the sides and in the front it takes the incoming flow head on, we have the total pressure port. So, both these pressures are important to us and we need to measure both of them. Okay. So, let us see how the pressure typing is done, this is just a close up of the same figure. It shows you that the tube that is used can be integrated to the pipe partially, but the probe where you do the measurement has to be absolutely flush with the pipe even a very small projection can lead to losses and errors and that is going to be a problem. So, this is a small hole which is drilled normal to the surface and on the bottom one is connected to the pressure measurement instrument. Uh, if you want to do it in a free flow that means external flow that one was internal flow. In external flow you create these holes equally spaced if possible on all along the periphery of the tube which is projecting into the flow direction. Notice that the front of the flue tube could be closed or open. For static pressure measurement, we do not want to worry about the air coming in, in the front, but in most cases as we will see very soon, we couple these two together. Okay. So, a P static probe is inserted without disturbing the flow streamlines. And uh, if you look at stagnation pressure measurement, the most commonly used instrument is called as a pitot-static tube. The last T is silent, it is called as a pitot-static tube and uh, this actually is used for measurement of both. I am sorry, we are talking about pitot tube right now. So, pitot tube does not have any static port, it is just a pitot tube. Pitot tube basically is to measure total or stagnation pressure, it is very simple. Just take a tube round the edges in the front, so that it does not create any sharp discontinuities and bend it perpendicular to the uh, stem, you get a tube which can be aligned to the flow and it measures total pressure. So, the fluid is decelerated asyntropically to rest. Now, how do you confirm that the fluid is brought to rest asyntropically in such a tube? why are the isentropic requirements or how are the isentropic requirements met? How can you be so sure that this particular method of bringing to rest is isentropic in nature? Can someone ponder over it and tell? Suppose we challenge and say no, this is not isentropic, then how will you justify? Because if we do not stop it asyntropically, then we are not making a true measurement. Okay. So, one requirement is it has to be perfectly parallel to the flow. Okay. So, this is something I will leave it to you for Moodle homework. Okay. People are very active in Moodle in this class, I am very happy. They are posting things on Moodle, but from now on we have to look at posting quality material. So, when you post material on Moodle, remember we are not playing a game of fastest finger first on ek minika, 1 mega crore pati, that you simply go Google the term, whatever first link you get copy and paste it, that is not the intention. I do not want to check how soon you can do a simple Google search, that is not the intention. The intention of asking you to go on Moodle is a self study aspect of this course. I would like you to ponder before you post. You can post YouTube videos because that improves clarity. Even you see I also use a lot of YouTube videos uh, to improve the clarity. That is not a, a problem. But the problem is like there was a post about rivets okay. uh, and I have given my comments on that on the Moodle page. Similarly, 
do not simply put something because it has to be put. The quality of the post that you put is going to be evaluated not the number. Okay? We, we want to see how much processing you do. Are you able to get some interesting material which is not hitherto available? Something simply from a textbook unless it is mentioned that okay, I want derivation of something to be shown, then it is okay. You can go to a textbook, you can copy, just give the reference and paste it. But merely putting something just for number game is not our intention. So now we have a very valid question. We have to now convince ourselves by arguments and by some kind of uh, explanation why a pito tube which consists of a simple bent tube, 90 degree bent tube immersed in flow provided it is kept perfectly aligned to the flow direction. Why is it and how is it sure that the flow is brought to rest isentropically? Okay? Argue out in a technical manner and then we will learn. The question that I want to now talk about is the instruments are for the people who work on instrumentation etc. But the pilot is the one who actually sees on board. So the question is how does the pilot see the pressure? The pilot sees the pressure basically by an instrument. In the olden uh, times there used to be dials where needles used to move such as the one that we are seeing. This is a Borden tube. But there could be other ways of also showing it to the pilot. You can show it digitally also. You can create the same display using electronics. Okay. So what we have nowadays is called as a glass cockpit. By glass cockpit we mean that the instrumentation or the display that you see on the aircraft are not physical or mechanical instruments. These are computer simulations of instruments. So these are basically most aircraft nowadays have what is called as a multifunctional display MFDs. There will be four of them typically and any of them can be made anything by programming. So if there is a pilot and co-pilot and there is a problem with the co-pilot, okay, I am just saying the whole instrumentation can be shifted to the left hand side and vice versa. So these kind of uh, facilities are available. In a combat aircraft for example, you may have a person sitting behind. Many combat aircraft have two member crew. So typically the person sitting behind will be doing the navigation, mission planning, weapon release etc. And the one in the front is going to do basic airmanship or flying. Suppose the person on, on the back seat has a problem. Suppose that person faints. The display can be transferred to the front so that the pilot can do all the actions. It is not that uh, now I cannot do anything because I cannot see. So that is the beauty of multifunction displays. But let us first go into what is currently available, uh, the physical instrumentation system. This is a very typical Borden tube which has got this Borden tube which deflects based on the pressure which is coming. I will soon show you a video. So the fluid, it could be water, it could be air. In aircraft normally we use air measurements. So the air will enter from there and that is going to basically lead to, so this is the open end on the bottom and the open end is fixed in place, it is held inside the instrumentation. The other end is a closed end to which we connect some kind of bell cranks and levers. So this is free to move. So the pressure of the fluid enters and the tube under reaction to that starts to straighten. As it straightens, then the tube will recoil and as the tube recoils, the pointer there is going to move the screen and this pointer movement will be seen by the pilot in the display. So this is the most basic instrument and it has to be calibrated on ground based on the pressure expected at a particular condition should be replicated. So one application would be engine oil pressure gauge, the other application could be hydraulic pressure gauge, the next one could be de-icing boot pressure gauge. And the fourth one could be oxygen tank. So any place where fluids are used in aircraft under pressure, you can use the fluid pressure itself to communicate to the pilot what is the magnitude of the pressure by moving the screen. So what is meant by de-ice? Anybody knows what is meant by de-icing? And what is meant by de-icing boot? There are two questions here. My name is Vinay. Yes, Vinay. Uh, 
uh, there is a formation of ice over the phosphate. So there is a device called de-icing system. Uh, it sprays alcohol and removes the, the whatever the ice okay. Okay, just a small correction. One need not have to go to high altitude for de-icing. Even at sea level, at very cold conditions, in many countries, you can have icing. Icing basically takes place when there is presence of ice. Okay, so yeah, mostly when aircraft are flying at high altitudes, temperature drops, so the icing builds up. But you can have icing even at ground level, at the airport before takeoff. So whenever there is collection of ice. We need to have a system which is meant to remove it called as de-icing system. So what is meant by de-ice boot? Anyone? Yes, the mic can go there. So de-icing we know, but what is meant by de-icing boot? On the wings, uh, when the, there is ice formation there, then there are rubber uh, pads which inflate and deflate that are called as uh, de-icing. That is right, thank you. So, there are many ways of de icing. One of the methods is called as a pneumatic de icing. You could do electrical de icing by sending a heat element, some current, and that melts the ice. But one very simple way is the mechanical method or the pneumatic method, where there are certain rubber based uh, contraptions typically near the quarter cord of the wing, upper and lower areas. So they start vibrating or they inflate and deflate which breaks the ice. So the inflation and deflation of that will require some fluid and that fluid will have some pressure and this tells the pilot. So if the de-ice boot pressure gauge shows 0, it means the de-icing system is not working. Okay. There is something called as a minimum equipment list or MEL when you fly an aircraft. So if you do not expect icing conditions during the flight you might be allowed to fly without the de-icing system working. Okay. It is not that every system of the aircraft has to always work in every flight. But if you are flying in what is called as a known icing conditions, then you will not be allowed to fly if the de-icing boot, so because it will be in the minimum equipment list. So when the pilot does a pre-flight check and sees de-icing boot pressure is 0, he or she checks, is it permitted to operate, if it is okay, known we fly. Similarly, oxygen tank pressure, why do we need oxygen in the aircraft? Oxygen system is required because when you go to high altitude for passengers as well as for the pilot, you need oxygen in the case of a situation where there is a complete loss of pressure and ambient air will not be breathable. Similarly, hydraulic pressure, similarly engine oil pressure. So these fluids, uh, they exert pressure and that is used in the Borden tube. Okay. Then there is another system called as a bellows. So bellows basically are a collection of diaphragm chambers which are joined together. Something like the spring, the, 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 you can see, uh, you can see there is a there is a uh, diagram of the bellows. So the pressure enters from the bottom. The spring is basically going to hold the bellows together when there is no pressure. When the pressure acts, the pressure forces against the spring. So the pressure force is acting on the spring and it is expanding the spring. It is a constrained spring. Okay. So it is a compressed shaped spring which will expand because of the acting of the pressure. And the movement of the side walls that is the bellows, they are correlated with the change in the pressure. Okay. And at the end you have a pointer linked to a scale. So as the bellows move, you will be able to get a reading. There is a short video showing how the bellows work. Bellow gauge contains an elastic element that is spring that is a convoluted unit that expands and contracts usually with changes in pressure. The spring in bellows gauges is made of brass, phosphor bronze, stainless steel or other metal that is suitable for the intended purpose of the gauge. Obviously, depending on the amount of pressure you are expecting and the size limitations in the instrumentation, you have to choose an appropriate material for the spring. And the material of the spring should be such that it can come back, it does not have any hysteresis, so that when you extend it, contract it thousand times, it does not have any permanent deformation. So that is why we have to go very carefully about the material. The movement of the bellows can be converted 
into linear displacement. This displacement can be converted in terms of pressure. As flow of pressure increases, a pointer starts rotating on the dial, which indicates the pressure of the flow. And to make this measurement precise, the scale of the dial is divided in many sectors. After some time, the pointer assumes a new position on the pressure calibrated scale on the dial to indicate the applied pressure directly. And thus, pressure is measured on the dial. Barrel gauge can... Okay, so this is very simple. In fact, this instrument is much simpler than even the Borden gauge. Because for the Borden gauge, you have to have provision for the displacement of the gauge. Okay. Here, there is no displacement. It is only the spring which is getting compressed or extended. Okay. So, this is the uh, information regarding pressure measurement. Now, let us go for air speed measurement. Now, for the air speed measurement, we use a system which is called as a pitot static system. Uh, in re respect to a scientist called Pito, who was very much active in pneumatics. Okay. So, this is a system that is used to measure the aircraft's air speed. We will see in detail how the system works, but in principle, you can see that uh, there is a tube which uh, is the one on the bottom, the L shaped tube. You take the ram air or the ambient air, you bring it to rest asyntropically, connect it and then there is also a static pressure. Okay. So, let us see how the system works uh, and then we will be able to talk about it in more detail. The pitot static system is an essential component that powers three vital flight instruments. The pitot static tube contains the baffle plate, the pitot tube, the static chamber and the pressure chamber. These are mechanical instruments. The hole in the front of the pitot tube is used to measure the ram air pressure that powers the speed indicator. The static port is just a small hole on the outside of the new plane that measures the outside air pressure. They are often found on the side of the fuselage or on the back of the pitot tube. The pitot tube's ram air only pushes the air speed's indicator's diaphragm. The air does not flow past the speed indicator. Static port pressure is fed through internal tubing where bellows expand and contract. That powers both the vertical speed indicator and the altimeter. We will study about them later. They indicate both climbs, descents and change in altitude. Both the static port and pitted tube are prone to multiple failures. The pitted static system must be inspected every 24 months. 24 months is just an indication actually it is inspected more frequently. Okay. So, the voice in the video was that of Siddharth Joshi who actually made this presentation. So, we saw that the system consists of a pitostatic tube which measures actually it has an intake which directly measures the total pressure and the static pressure comes from the side of the aircraft through the static holes which we will see very soon. So, the difference of them can be shown as the dynamic pressure or half rho V square and therefore, you can get the value of V. The other two instruments, the vertical sphere indicator and the altimeter work only on the static port because they are only going to measure the parameters based on the static pressure which changes. Okay. So, this is how the pitot static system works. So, there is a pitot tube, there is a static port, there is a instruments and there is an alternative static port for removing the errors or any uh, blockings because of any blockage or any error there could be mismatch. So, there are backup. So, you can see in this particular example the pitot tube is mounted on the fuselage. It could be in the nose, there could be a boom coming out in the front with the pitot static tube. There are many many locations. Okay. 
and the location is decided based on different aircraft to remove an error which we will study about called as the position error. Basically, we want it to be in substantially undisturbed flow. Okay. We want it to be like that. All right. So, ram air pressure enters the tube and it prevents ice from blocking the air inlet to drain hole etc. We have already seen this, this is a simple explanation uh, and I am putting this in the presentation merely to allow you to use it for self study. I think the system is very standard. So, this is a photograph of a static port which is on the side of the fuselage. So, these are small air inlets which are on the aircraft side and they are the ones which are conveying the static pressure to this particular system. Alternatively, you also need to have some other static ports to ensure that if there is a blockage, you do not get any false readings. So, there could be static ports on the other side of the fuselage, there could be static ports at some other place, but the important point to be kept in mind is that there should not be a location of static port which causes errors. It should actually be in such a place where it is perfectly perpendicular to the oncoming free stream. So, you could put it on the side of the pitostatic tube itself which is done most of the cases or you could put it at some other locations on the aircraft. Okay. So, where are they located? So, you can see here these are examples of the main and the backup static ports on one transport aircraft and this is another example uh, of uh, the location of static port and these are actually sign posted very clearly. Okay. So, these are uh, sign posted. So, there is a pitostatic system which actually involves these three instruments. Variometer is basically the indication of the uh, change in the height. Let us look at the airspeed indicator first. It is a differential pressure system which measures both dynamic air pressure and static pressure. So, the dynamic pressure is converted. So, total pressure it is wrong, the total pressure comes from the pitot tube and the static comes from the static port and the difference is going to push. So, interestingly the air does not go through the instrumentation. Yes, there is a question. Sir, as static ports are perpendicular to the flow uh, air flow, then do not you think when air will flow the local pressure uh, just above the stat, uh, static uh, hole will get uh, get down, so we will get false reading. Hmm. Why do you think so? Sir, because uh, according to Bernoulli principle, uh, when the velocity uh, dynamic head is high, then the we get the static low static reading. So, when I say perpendicular to the flow, what I mean is that if the air is flowing like this, I put it like this. So, when I put it like this, dynamic pressure is not conveyed to that port. No? But sir, local, uh, local pressure will get reduced. Why? There is, there is a stream, let us say there is a streamline. On that streamline, you have a flow of velocity v. So, if I put the probe along the flow direction opposing it, then I am going to bring it to rest asyntropically or maybe it just goes through then I can understand, but if, if there is a flow stream this way and the port is this way, then it is going to measure only static pressure. Uh, how will Bernoulli's principle make any difference on this? Actually, I thought that uh, total energy must be constant of uh, 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 that uh, pressure head plus dynamic head must be constant. Right. So, if dynamic head is riding, uh, rising, then the… Uh, why, why is it rising? Because uh, there is a velocity of the air. So, the dynamic head is there. Yeah. So, there is a dynamic head. It is not rising. Okay. The dynamic head… See, I, as I said, you locate these instruments at a place where the velocity is roughly equal to the free stream velocity. That means, the velocity is constant. If I put it at a place where there is a bulge in the aircraft, then I understand your point that because there is a bulge in the aircraft, the local velocity there may not be equal to free stream velocity. Then there can be errors, but the location of the static port is at those places on the aircraft where we do not expect too much change in the uh, ambient velocity. There will be a change. See, the presence of any body 
definitely will affect but how much so instead of putting it right let's say below behind the propeller then it is a wrong reading because the propeller is going to give some dynamic pressure or if i put it in the wake region where there is a reverse flow or if i put it at some other place where the flow is separated so i put it in a location where i expect the flow to be attached okay where i expect the flow to be maybe slightly more than the ambient or almost equal to ambient and undisturbed so the direction uh, is such so that's why on the fuselage sides uh, below the cockpit not very much ahead not not too much behind okay good any other question anybody has yes mike please so myself venkat sai yes so the boundary layer effect uh, it, it, it will show some effect on static pressure no sir definitely definitely it will so the thing is this uh, either you keep it projected out like uh, i showed you some examples where there is a lateral gap between the fuselage and the pitostatic tube the purpose of that is as long as you clear the boundary layer you will not be so the boundary layer is going to slowly build up okay so that is why the location of the static ports is such that we do not expect it is normally located at a point before the expected transition point so there will be boundary layer but it will be perhaps laminar or the disturbance because of that will be minimal but still we will correct for it we will not take that direct pressure reading we are always doing a compensation which i will talk about sir, and one more doubt. yes sir uh, i want to add a point to his point man. yes sir uh, let us consider an aircraft is flying at some altitude yeah. fixed altitude yeah and as the aircraft speed increases aircraft speed increases the dynamic pressure increases yes so there may be chance of decrease in static pressure and we may get wrong altitude value no 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 if the dynamic pressure is increasing why should static pressure decrease because i mean uh, I mean, as per uh, as per Bernoulli principle, the velocity increases, the static pressure decreases. I mean, as per a constant pressure. Is pressure. it is it is it really true? Is it along? Do you agree with this? So, let me see if somebody can clarify this point. Yeah, take the mic, please. Hmm. So, uh, the the error in his assumption is because the it is not the fluid that is flowing. So, it's not its energy that is we have to consider. the relative velocity dynamic head that is the fluid is getting is because of the motion of the aircraft so the relative velocity uh, just we cannot assume that because the velocity is increasing the static pressure is decreasing the pressure of the air is constant it is the speed of the uh, aircraft that is increasing hmm. and thereby there is an increase in the okay anybody else would like to add yes my name is devan sharma yes uh, so i think in this case when uh, aircraft is increasing its speed so the flow is not steady so we cannot apply bernoulli's principle in this case uh, we, we need to account for the energy change also no why do you think the flow will become unsteady is it going to a flow is unsteady when there is a time component to flow yeah. so this unsteadiness is a is present now i don't agree with you the flow can be still steady when i am in a let us say i am in a cruising flight i maintain a velocity and then i accelerate it doesn't mean that the flow is unsteady unsteadiness is present in a flow only when there is a time related component of the flow okay so it's not because the flow is steady or unsteady okay. and anyway in unsteady flow we cannot apply bernoulli's principle so there is no question of saying that the flow is unsteady and hence bernoulli states something bernoulli cannot be applied so unsteadiness is not the reason or not the, the not the justification okay think about anybody you have also had a point just next to you there is a person so my name is amog yes so we are placing the pitter tubes at positions where there is like like uh, where the speed of the aircraft is not affecting the uh, wind speed outside the aircraft so even if we are accelerating the stream velocity of the wind is not changing therefore i don't think burn 
there will be any change in static pressure yeah, measure. I would say do not try to bring in any Bernoulli principle here ok, do not think that because we have studied Bernoulli's principle we have to put it everywhere. This is a very simple thing now, you are locating as far as possible these sensors in the area where the conditions are equivalent to the free stream conditions. So, the free stream has some static pressure simply because of the altitude and the free stream has static pressure uh, dynamic pressure because of its velocity. So, as long as I do not mess up with them I will not be getting too many errors in the instrumentation ok, shall we go ahead convinced ok, yes. Hello. Yes. Sir, my name is Vidushi. Yes, Vidushi. My question is that uh, will the uh, pressure measured will, be, will it be different? Uh, will it differ with the speed of the uh, aircraft? Will it change? The you mean to say that which pressure? Static pressure or dynamic pressure? Static pressure. No, static pressure is a function only of the altitude. So, what is static pressure? at that altitude because of the weight of the atmosphere above it, what is the load acting on an element above and below and we showed in the first class I think or in the second class, first class was just course introduction. In our first lecture on atmosphere we showed that the static pressure basically is a function only of location in the atmosphere. So, if an aircraft is flying at any speed. Now, if you bring in supersonic flow, shock waves, shock wave boundary layer interaction then things might change slightly, but let us keep it away. Let us say we are flying from Mach number 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, static pressure will have no change, the only change will be the dynamic pressure ok, yeah, Mike. Yes. Sir, my name is Vardil and my doubt is that. Uh, when we say pressure altitude then we look at the rating of the pressure and we compare with the standard atmosphere and we said that we are at this altitude. So, when we read the pressure reading will it be a total pressure or static pressure or dynamic pressure? What do you think? I think total pressure. Why? Why are we bringing in velocity effect? Total pressure is dynamic plus static. Yes. So, why are we bringing in the velocity factor into consideration? We want to measure the pressure in the atmo uh, we want to we want to find out what is the pressure that aircraft is facing and that pressure is faced by an aircraft under the ISA table at so and so altitude. So, it is static pressure. So, when we yeah so altitude I will show you very soon altitude measurement, altitude measurement is only using static pressure ok, it is just static pressure. We will not use total pressure for altitude measurement ok. So, let us now see how this air speed indicator works. So, very short video. Fly through the air faster and faster. As shown by the animation, the air striking the pitot tube enters more rapidly and this expands the diaphragm further and further. The diaphragm is connected to the sector through levers which rotate it and in turn this rotates the hand taft pinion that is directly connected to the speed dial and displays the current speed. As you fly through the air faster and faster as shown by ok. So, it is very simple as the speed of the air coming in that pitostatic tube or a pitot tube keeps on increasing the bellows are going to expand more because they are under higher pressure and um, there will be a static pressure acting opposing to it. So, the difference will be the dynamic pressure. So, this is how the ASI work. So, you have one line you have static pressure from inside and outside the diaphragm they cancel out ok. So, the change in the air speed is shown by the needle. Ok. So, now we have to look at corrections because whatever is measured by the instrument one should not blindly believe it ok. If the aircraft is flying at a reasonable speed and you know it is flying because you can see things going past you and the air speed indicator shows 0, it does not mean that the speed is 0 ok. Can it happen in a flight? Do you think it can happen in a flight that the aircraft is flying? and the indicator shows 0, what could be the reason? Under what condition can you have? Yes. My name is Yes. The opening of the pitot is more, 
Hmm. So, will it show infinite speed or zero speed? Why? If the opening is blocked, the opening is blocked. So, what will the instrument read? Hmm. Where is the momentum transferring to the instrument? We stop the air. No, the opening is blocked. So, there is no sensing now. The opening is blocked. So, if the opening is blocked, then the pressure conveyed is how much? Okay. At what height do we have zero pressure? Where? In space. So, it will show that you are in space because it does not get any pressure. Okay. So, when can you when can you see it zero? Yes. When will you see the pressure is zero? Uh, when you when the reading is zero? If the, if the opening is blocked, then uh, how come it will show infinite pressure? No, not infinite pressure. It will show zero pressure. Uh, yes, uh, how come it will show zero pressure? Where is pressure zero in atmosphere? Where is the pressure highest in the atmosphere? At the ground level. So, if you go up, pressure reduces, 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 reduces. Where do you get zero pressure? Uh, outside the atmosphere. Correct. So, that means if the if the if the indicator is blocked, it should show infinity, right? It should show that you are in outer space where there is no pressure. The instrument does not know whether it is sensing or whether there is a mistake. Sir, but there will not be vacuum inside the instrument. There will be some air inside the instrument. So, that air is stationary and now the intake is blocked. So, the pressure acting on the bellows by a stationary fluid in a tube is 0. But the fluid will have some pressure. Why will it have a pressure? Pressure from the fluid comes either because of motion or because of the altitude. Now, you have a tube containing air and you block it. The, the no, you try it out, take a tube, okay, put a pressure gauge and just block the pressure will be 0 and pressure is 0 at infinity altitude so in the atmosphere. It measures the pressure when it is changing. No, 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 not that. It pressure, it measures the pressure which is conveyed to it. If it, if that, if you remove the block, suddenly it will show, get some pressure because now the, now the static pressure is going to be conveyed to the instrument. So, if you remove the block, it will show the correct pressure and that correct pressure will move the instrument to the correct value. Okay. So, now the question is when will it show 0? Yes, anybody can answer or you want to do it on Moodle? Yes, what do you think? When will the instrumentation show 0 speed? So, my name is Namya. Hmm. I think uh, when the wind speed is the same as the speed of the aeroplane, there is no net difference between the speed will it show 0, velocity, air speed. What do you think? Are we measuring relative speed in the instrument or the real uh, total uh, or the actual speed? Yes, I didn't get that one. Later. Will the wind affect the air speed? I'm asking the question to everybody in the class. It's a good point. Do you think if the if the speed? So do you think do you think the instrument is showing you the true air speed? or the relative air speed? If you answer yourself, you are saying that if the aircraft is flying at a speed v and the wind is coming from the front at speed v opposite direction, then the instrument should read 0. But the instrument in the instrumentation, did we ever say measure the speed of the aircraft, measure speed of the wind, do the cancellation and then display? We did not. So, what we are measuring is only the ambient wind speed. So, think about it. Let us see the corrections first. Okay. So, there is something called as a indicated air speed. Okay. The indicated air speed is what the pilot sees in the instrument. It could be 0, it could be infinity. Suppose the tube is broken. Suppose the needle is jammed. Okay. The needle which is supposed to move, there is a breakage. And now the needle has fallen to 0. Now, whatever speed you fly, it will show 0. Correct? If the instrument is faulty, 
if the instrumentation has got some mechanical or electrical disconnection it will show zero because it's not sensing anything it's it's a it's not working basically so the indicated air speed is what the pilot sees but that is not the actual aircraft speed because this instrument has been calibrated based on pressure on the ground so there are some errors in the instrument for example the dial has got some friction so under some pressure it should move to 38 degrees but it is moving only 30 degrees because there is a friction or there is some error or there is some permanent elongation so these are called as instrument errors including breakage of the link so on ground when you do the maintenance of the instrument you say let us give it a dynamic pressure and see what it shows so in every aircraft there is a small placard which shows if the instrument says 300 read 290 if it shows 350 read 320 if it shows this read this okay because and that card is changed by the maintenance people every time that is a simple calibration of the instrumentation this is what you do in experiments also before any experiment that you do you should do calibration same thing we do in the instrument so let us assume that now we remove the instrument errors so then the speed which the instrument shows is called as the calibrated air speed that means a perfectly working air speed indicator should show this particular speed when so much dynamic pressure is acting on the system that means so much now the instrumentation basically does not worry about what is the static uh, total pressure what is the static pressure it works only on the difference because on one side you put static pressure on one side you put total pressure the difference is what moves it so now we come to a speed called as the calibrated air speed so can i say now that a calibrated air speed is the speed that an error free instrument should show clear this is very important because when we do aircraft performance in the post mid semester portion you will have to understand and correct the values otherwise you will be getting wrong answers i am warning you right now many people will simply take the numbers and start punching them without processing it and i am going to give you a very interesting assignment where you need to know how to convert the things so the calibrated air speed is what an error free instrument should show any doubt on that okay so now let us assume a theoretical scenario that the errors in the instrument are zero so what you see is what you should have got which is the calibrated air speed but is that the true speed it is not for that we have to understand the working so the working is very simple the dynamic pressure in an incompressible flow is can be shown as to be half rho v square so p total is half rho v square plus p static so if you subtract p static then you get half rho v square so half is the constant but rho is the density density of what of the air and as we know the density of the air does not remain constant as we go from one altitude to the other so what does it depend on what does density of air depend on yeah Saurabh you can speak what is it what does it depend upon yeah it depends on uh, temperature and humidity humidity temperature and the altitude from the ground altitude from the ground anything else anything else will affect the density of the ambient air perhaps these are the only things something new yes uh, speed of air right even the Mach number, even the Mach number, there is a relationship between 
the density and the Mach number also. So, whatever it is, it is not the same at all altitudes. So, when you calibrate the instrument on the ground, see I cannot do the calibration of the instrument at various altitudes, I will calibrate only on ground. So, what do I do on the ground is I apply some pressure into the I, I apply some pressure into the total port and I open the static port to atmosphere on the ground. The instrument reads the differential pressure. So, that is equal to half rho v square, but which rho is it? That rho is actually rho 0 or rho at the test condition. So, if I test at Mumbai, it will be rho at Mumbai and that too rho at Mumbai will not be the same in summer, winter, there will be minor changes. So, assume a condition when you are calibrating the instrument under perfect ISA sea level conditions. The density of the air is going to be 1.2256 kg per meter square that is the ideal sea level value. So, you tell you, you do the calibration so that if there is so much pressure which is being put into the instrument that pressure is equal to half rho v square. So, that V it should show, let us say it is 180 knots, then you change the pressure and you make the instrument such that it shows that one. So, remember that rho is constant at sea level or in testing condition, so it is V square versus pressure. So, you keep on uh, adding more pressure and it should show velocity as a function of square and then you seal the instrument. So, when the pilot is flying this aircraft now in New York at a height of 2 kilometers under a very cold condition, the air which is coming in the instrument is not at the same density as the air which came when the instrument was calibrated. Okay. The instrument was calibrated at Mumbai at sea level. Okay, but so much pressure equal to so much velocity. Now, the same pressure if it is occurring in New York at 2 kilometer altitude at much more speed because that half rho v square is equal to this half rho v square, what will the instrument show? No, not different. See, understand, I gave some pressure to the instrument at Mumbai at sea level. I have removed the instrument errors, it shows 180. The same pressure is exerted by an aircraft flying in New York at 2 kilometer altitude at some speed. If the pressure that is coming in is same as what was here, the instrument will show again 180, correct, but the speed is not 180. The speed corresponds to 180 only under that density. The density there is not the same. So, just imagine a situation, forget about New York and other things, let us say in Mumbai only you fly the aircraft at 2 kilometer altitude. Okay. Will your density be lower or higher? Are you sure? Density will be lower? Are you sure? My name is Lord. Okay. Density of air at 2 kilometers in Mumbai, is it lower or higher than the density at sea level? 100 percent sure? Positive? Yes. Do not don't worry, you say yes. It is lower, <laughs> that will be lower obviously. <laughs> I am just trying to scare, sorry. It is lower. Okay. So, if the pressure which is acting on the instrument at 2 kilometer, tell me, I ask you another question now. Assume that the instrument is showing 180 knots, the instrument calibrated at Mumbai at sea level is now flown at 2 kilometers, it shows 180 knots. So, what is the pressure acting in the instrument? The pressure acting in the instrument is the same which was acting at the same instrument at sea level when it showed 180. So, that pressure is half into rho 2 kilometers into V 2 kilometer square and this pressure was half rho 0 into V 0 square, V 0 was 180. 
So this 180 will not be the same because rho 2 kilometers is not same as rho 0. So since rho 2 kilometers is going to be lower, the velocity will be higher. In other words, whatever this is how you remember it, you get confused sometimes. So basically you always tell yourself the pilot always sees a velocity which is lower or equal to the actual. The pilot always sees a velocity which is lower or equal to the actual because the density of the air at any altitude is going to be definitely lower than density at sea level under ISA conditions, correct. So therefore, the true air speed that means at 2 kilometer I was flying at 190 knots, but the pressure that was created half into rho at 2 kilometers which is lower than rho 0 into 190 square is equal to half rho 0 into 180 square. Instrument only measures pressure. So when I when I tell students about working of the uh, working of the uh, calibrated air speed I always say the calibrated air listen to my words okay the calibrated air speed is the reading that an instrument will show when the pressure acting on the instrument will be same as the pressure acted on the instrument when at that reading it was at sea level. Is it clear? So therefore the true air speed is always going to be either equal to or lower than unless you have a rare situation in which the density of the air at 2 kilometers is more than sea level density. Can it happen? Is it possible? Is it possible that density of air at 2 kilometers at any place in the world is more than density at sea level? Where is it possible? Yes. So is there a place on earth where the mean sea level is 2 kilometers or 2.5 kilometers? Unlikely, right? You cannot have a place which has, I can understand 100 meters, 200 meters difference. But to find a place where the sea is at 2 kilometer altitude from sea at Mumbai is not generally possible. But let us not talk about all these things. We are saying that in general, the indicated airspeed is going to be always more than or less than the true airspeed. So then you have true air speed, you account for the changes in temperature and density, then you get the true air speed. Now this true air speed is what actually the pilot wants to know because the pilot, the aircraft will not stall or will not misbehave or will not do anything based on the indicated air speed. For all you know, instrument is blocked, IAS could be 0 or infinity, it does not matter. Aircraft works on physics, not on instrumentation. So therefore, for all phenomena where you need to know the actual speed, you need to have a correction between the IAS and the TAS. So from IAS you get CAS, removing instrument errors. From CAS to TAS you get the true air speed. Now we forgot one small thing here which is called as the position error. That is the error in the readings because of the location of the pitostatic tube that could come also under the uh, IAS to CAS conversion. So when I say instrument error, you can say instrument error because of the mechanical instrument and because of the location. Remember all discussion is applicable right now only in subsonic flow where the other effects are not yet modeled. When we go further, we will look at modeling of. now. The other thing is ground speed. So now come to your point. You are flying at 100 knots and the wind is coming at 100 knots, opposing direction. So now what is going to happen is, you are actually flying at 100 knots physically, but to an observer on the ground, you are stationary. Because for the observer, there is no relative motion now. So the ground speed is the speed of the aircraft with respect to the ground and remember the ground speed can be negative also. 
if the oncoming wind is at 20 knots and you have a small UAV which is flying at 5 knots, then your ground speed could be minus 15 knots, it is possible. So, ground speed is used for what purpose? What is the advantage of ground speed? Who will need ground speed? Yes. Hello, my name is Dinesh. Yes. It is air traffic control in uh, airport, they use the ground speed. Why? For landing purposes and takeoff purpose. In what way? You mean to say? No, they tell the pilot that the headwind is so much, crosswind is so much, tailwind is so much. That I understand. But why will the air traffic controller, what will he do with the ground speed? I do not think it is the ATC. No, ATC is not concerned about ground speed. Somebody else. Yes, now let me just see if you have the answer. Who wants to worry about the ground speed? The pilots. Why? Because, because they will require to know that what is their speed with, with respect to the ground. Uh, why so do they, they want? They should know ki how much fuel they have so that. Like they will calculate the, if, they, if I am going to land uh, at a distance of 10 kilometers, the airport is 10 kilometers away. So, like they will need to know okay, how much time will it take to, for them. To no, to honestly speaking pilots are not concerned about how much time it, because they are flying the aircraft. Because when they reach the aircraft, the ATCO may say go for one circle, mm -hmm. then one more circle, 10 circles, pilots cannot do anything. So, it is the airline who is interested, not the pilots. Okay? It is the relatives of the people who are coming in to receive you, to pick you up. So, for example, just as a theoretical example, if the aircraft is flying at 100 knots and the wind speed is 100 knots headwind, you can tell the relatives just wait for infinity because this plane will never come to your place. It, it cannot, no? relative speed is matching, so the aircraft is virtually stationary. On the other hand, I will talk about this when I come to range and endurance. I will give you a very beautiful example in which the presence of headwind and tailwind can create a time difference of 2 hours in flying between Mumbai and New York, 2 hours and it can save 12 tons of fuel for the airline. Then I will talk about this. Right now we will go ahead. So, we have to apply the corrections and this is the sequence in which the corrections are applied. Okay. Yes. Indicated airspeed and true airspeed. So, you can see this is the instrument that the pilot gets and that shows, it just shows IAS. No, no, I never said that the indicated airspeed is 0 if the relative wind is 0. I never said that. I said the ground speed is 0. There is a difference. The If the aircraft is flying, whatever be the headwind, there will be pressure acting on the instrument and that pressure will be read as a speed. So, the indicated air speed is the speed of the aircraft. Whether it is flying in headwind or tailwind is not important. So, the what you are asking is the ground speed. So, the indicated air speed could be 100, ground speed could be 0. Hmm, that means you are no that is a tailwind yeah okay tailwind so at that time what will happen see because the aircraft is flying the instrument attached to it will face some oncoming wind now because it is flying now air from the back is coming and pushing doesn't matter that is not really going to affect the instrumentation the pressure will be read the ground speed will change based on headwind or tailwind presence or absence. Not necessary. See, do not mix up indicated air speed with the ground speed. Do not mix up indicated air speed with the relative wind. The IAS is not reading relative wind. The IAS is reading the wind. Uh, the IAS is reading the speed of the aircraft based on the pressure that the aircraft is facing because of the oncoming wind. Okay. So, the IAS or the indicated airspeed is what the pilot will actually see, but it is dangerous for the pilot not to know the true airspeed. So, therefore, there is also a small 
scale inside you can see in the same picture called as TAS it is hidden by the needle. So, in this example the true air speed is approximately 140, but the indicated air speed is only 105, yeah, 5, 10, 15, 20. So, this is 105 indicated air speed, true air speed is actually 140. So, as you can see the true air speed is more than, so how is it more? How is it more? Is it going to be more? Then what is the problem here? Okay. So, the air speed that the pilot reads is directly and there could be errors. So, these could be the errors. Okay. So, this is a small uh, wheel which the pilots use it is uh, old instrumentation where dial type thing. So, we can use the calibrated. So, you remove it for the position and the instrument errors okay. and uh, this is in the aircraft operating handbook because they are designed for standard conditions. So, you can get chart like this calibration chart if the speed shows 110 actual value is little bit less or little bit more. So, if this line is 45 degree that means it is correct instrument if there is a slope more slope less that shows the error in the instrumentation. So, we normally do it with a handheld GPS because GPS will give you the actual location and you can have time and GPS uh, time from a clock and the GPS location you can use that to do calibration. This uh, and then this is a detail which we will skip right now. Okay. So, these are again instruments. I want to keep it for you for self reading. Yeah. Because, so now I want to ask you another interesting question which is what he has raised. Do you think the pilot is happy only to know the true air speed or the what is the advantage of indicated air speed for the pilot? That is the question that you are raising right. So, now can someone tell me if we as engineers or instrumentation experts can do the corrections and tell the pilot this is your true air speed the job is over then why should we tell the pilot what is your indicated air speed ok. Because the pilot has to apply corrections to that to get the calculated air speed. So, why why is it needed for the pilot to know the indicated air speed. Okay, this is the question I do not want to answer. I would like this to be answered by you on Moodle. So, there must be some advantage. In today's uh, technological world do not tell me that you cannot do the correction and tell the pilot because you are giving pilot both. You saw the dial. The dial showed that the true air speed was 140 indicated was 110. So, do not tell me that is not possible, but then why not show him only the 140 only the true air speed why show him the indicated him or her. So, now that is a question which I want you to answer ok. So, at low speeds and low altitudes yeah you want to answer the question ok you have another question that is good. So, so uh, true air speed should always be higher than the high air right? What do you think? It should be higher. Always ok. Why Why should it be higher? Yeah. So, assuming no. that the density decreases as we go, go up. up. Ok. So, why was there an error in the picture you showed? Which, so which error? Because higher. So, you said that there was an error. Right? No, you think about it. The density is the density of the air at high altitude is lower. Yeah. So, the total sorry the pressure at which the instrument shows 110 the same pressure is acting when the density is lesser. So, the speed has to be higher. Yes. So, I only said that the indicated air speed is always lower than that of the true air speed. Okay. There is no error in the instrument it is working correctly. The true air speed is more than the indicated air speed which is typically the case. So, at low speeds and low altitudes the three speeds oh now we have one more speed called as the equivalent air speed. So, now we are into a soup we have somehow skipped this why did we skip this ok. So, equivalent air speed sorry I it is my mistake I thought I can skip but it is important. The equivalent air speed is the air speed when you remove the compressibility errors especially at high altitudes 
because the density change happens due to static due to altitude and also because of speed as my friend rightly mentioned that there will be a change in density because of altitude and because of speed that correction is the compressibility correction and that correction when you do it you can get what is called as the equivalent air speed which is the air speed that should have been shown on the instrument without. So, this is for very important because the equivalent air speed is actually the one that is the dynamic pressure acting on the aircraft. So, from the loads point of view from stalling etcetera that is the input. So, it is a function of dynamic pressure. So, EAS basically is equal to 2 q by rho 0. Remember I am not using rho, uh, rho altitude here. Okay. So, suppose I replace rho 0 by rho altitude q is half rho v square. The q is half rho v square which is the rho at the altitude. But I am saying root of 2 q divided by q naught rho naught. So, rho naught is the standard density 1.2256 kg per meter per meter cube. So, that is why it is equivalent air speed. This is the speed that gives the same pressure with the compressibility effects removed. Okay. So, since the value of so you will get uh, some more indication there. So, at low speed flight they are all same. So, the true air speed will be the equivalent air speed into rho naught by rho. Rho naught is the density at sea level conditions, rho is the density actual condition. So, since rho is less than rho naught therefore, what is the which is more TAS or EAS? In high speed flight you have a function of Mach number also. Okay. So, you have to have you have to put that Mach number function that is what our friend mentioned this A naught rho is the effect of the density. Okay. So, this is the equation when you bring in temperature. So, look we are not here to derive these expressions because in the introductory course of fluid mechanics or introduction to flight we are interested in just knowing what the relationships are. So, you do not have to really worry about you know uh, talking about let us go to ground speed. The actual speed of the aircraft over the ground. So, you correct the true air speed for the wind effects headwind or tailwind. So, if you have a headwind it subtracts headwind means coming from the head tailwind coming from the tail which one is better that is what you think takeoff distance will be less or more depending on headwind or tailwind. Okay. So, we will talk about it. Okay. So, this is how you do it see there is a resultant ground speed. So, suppose there is a wind coming at an angle then you have to take a vectorial addition and get the value of ground speed. Okay. Right. Now, let us look at the markings in the indicator there are these regions you know green region, yellow region and red region. So, from pilot safety point of view. So, obviously, the white arc depicts the normal flap operating condition that means, what is the speed at which the flaps can be operated because if you do not the flaps may break off. Flaps cannot take so much structural loading they are only meant to be deployed in takeoff and landing. And in military aircraft we also have combat flaps, but very small angle 5 degrees perhaps 15 degrees in some cases. So, that is a different case, but in general flaps are not to be deployed after you achieve the climb and before you come into land. So, therefore, there is a maximum speed at which flaps can be deflected. So, that is indicated the green arc represents the normal operating range on the airplane and there is a cautionary range that is yellow color. So, now if you are flying at the yellow color area and you have turbulent weather it can become dangerous because the loads will become very high. So, the pilot is told if you are expecting disturbed weather conditions take it to the green region do not go in the yellow region and then you have a maximum allowable speed to the red line that should be never exceeded, but can the pilot exceed that speed. Do you think it is possible for this pilot to fly beyond 230? How is it possible? 
what does the pilot have to do to fly at a speed more than the maximum permissible speed? Yes. Sir, if engine is capable enough to go beyond that speed, then after that, that uh, the, uh, the 230 or 240, the structural limit will be exceeded. As uh, uh, as uh, happened in the one air, air, air crash when the uh, aircraft just plunged down with uh, uh, with uh, uh, speed uh, speed more than the limiting speed and its flap and all the uh, components were just flew, uh, teared off that. Yeah. So the pilot can exceed this speed either using the power of the engine if the engine can give that much power or you can go for a dive. Okay.